myself, I'm John Losey, and I work with Into Wisdom Group and Praxis Training. And the uh, reason I, I, I wanted to do this is because I know that I have lots of friends. I actually worked in the classroom for a little bit, but it was too hard. And now I have total respect for all you people who stand up and, and do all the work that it takes to be a great classroom teacher. And when you were thrown in the virtual environment, uh, it was, it, to me, I've been working virt with virtual meetings and, and uh, training and all that kind of stuff for a while. And it's not easy to pick up. I know that it took you a while to develop your craft in the classroom. And now you are asked to, to translate all that in the virtual environment. And it's hard. And I know you have high expectations for yourself. So when it doesn't go as you think it does, it really hurts because you want to serve your students well. I thought, man, if I could show what's possible in the virtual context, uh, engage your imagination so that now you can take the stuff that you did, that you do in the classroom in person and figure out a way to translate that in the virtual environment. So today what we're doing is we're going to do, this is not a how-to, this isn't a training. This is an orientation to show you some of the things that are possible and then have you guys think about, wow, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. Uh, and then uh, kind of take all those ideas and get them back out to everybody so that then you can start to try and practice these things and develop your classroom skills, your, 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 your virtual class skills. Now we're doing this in Zoom but these concepts translate to any platform that you have. Some are better at some things than others, but the idea is that if you can think past the technology and not be so intimidated by the technology, um, you're gonna be able to do great things virtually. And then it's also probably gonna help you facilitate your class better as well. So I also wanna introduce uh, last week, if you were part of that wonderful experience, uh, you know, uh, if you're not willing to fail, you're not willing to grow. And I had probably one of my greatest uh, uh, Zoom fails last week. And part of the things that I, I didn't listen to my own advice, which is if you have more than 10 or 15 people in a session, have a producer, have somebody who's co-facilitating. So this is, this, watch this learning happening. I want to introduce Dan Miller. I, <laughs> I'm pointing over here, but he's actually, he's this way. No, I'm over, I'm over, I'm over here. Yeah. Yeah. So Dan is a, an amazing uh experiential facilitator. We've been working together now for several months on this, on the virtual thing, but we met first, he was the, the professional development person for AEE for several years. Now he's out on his own doing amazing things with some uh, college orientation programs and other programs around virtual facilitation. So I feel very fortunate to have Dan here. He's just backing me up today, but man, he's much more capable uh, than just being a backup. If you have technical <laughs> questions, Chat Dan in the in the chat box down below. Yeah, let me um. I'll I'll share my screen right now, and we'll be doing a lot of this because this is part of the orientation. Uh, the chat function is down below here. Most of you probably know what that is, but I want to make sure uh, that we cover it down at the bottom here. And uh, if you have a question, a technical question, uh, if you're having trouble with something, Dan can help you out. Chat that either to him or to everybody. Um, the uh, the idea is that Dan is here to, number one, make sure that you guys all get support. He's going to pay attention to the chat so that I can focus on the process. And then if what happens last week happens, he's got all the materials on his machine so he can take over and, and we'll play it off like we planned it that way. Now it's Dan's turn. Mm -hmm. So uh, You'll never was... know that it was John's internet that blew up. <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk, about, we'll talk about safety and everything, but I wanna encourage you all to jump in. We're gonna play with these things, then we're gonna go in breakout rooms and you're going to brainstorm with each other about how you might use them. Uh, and at the end, we'll do what I call a meta section where we can then jump in and answer questions about how did that happen? How did you do that? How, and extend the learning that way. And that'll come at the end. Um, everybody good with that? Good to hear, thank you. So let's go back to uh, shared screen, why orient? What I discovered is that a high, I have a really high expectation for myself. And I think there's a few people in the room that do too. So when we switched to virtual, I immediately assumed I should be as good at the virtual platform as I am in person. 
And that created great frustration because I wasn't. And there's no reason I, sh I, I should have been. We don't throw people, yeah, like if you go to a new school, you don't know where everything is. You have to be oriented to that space, that process, their policies. And the expectation is that you should get that orientation before you're asked to perform. I don't know that uh, educators got a proper orientation to the virtual format before they were asked to perform. And so I've done this with, I've done this type of orientation with a lot of experiential and camp and uh, other, other types of people involved in, in personal and professional development. And I thought, man, uh, educators, and if you're in California, you know, everybody's realizing that it's not going to go back to in person or even blended. It's all going to be virtual again when school starts up. So let's, let's get educators oriented so that they can dream about what's possible and, um, and then perform to the expectations that they have for themselves. I put up the, the uh, objectives or outcomes that are based here. You'll get this. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I, I think the third one, the one at the bottom is really important that uh, I want you guys, after we explore these, these tools and ideas that you walk away uh, hopeful and excited about the possibilities of being virtual and not dreading it, or at least not dreading it as much. So I want to, we're going to go to breakout rooms in just a minute in just a moment. And in that 10 minute breakout, what I want you to do is just introduce yourself, what, where you work, organization, you know, what role you play. Are you a, a classroom teacher, an administrator? Maybe you don't work in the classroom, you're a counselor. Uh, and then spend the majority of the time after you introduce yourself talking about what makes a learning environment great. And I'm going to take you back to Mentimeter and as you are talking, I want you to add to what makes a learning environment great. We started this last week, but just kind of type in as you guys are talking, you have, this is an open-ended question. So you've got 25 or 250 words that you can use or characters to put it in and you can put in as many as you want. So when you go to the breakout room, you're going to, uh, you're going to just introduce yourself, take some time to introduce each other. There's going to be three or four people in there, so you'll have time to jump into it. Ten minutes. I'll be giving you little uh, messages to let you know how much time is left. Just pay attention. I'll give you a two-minute warning so that you know to wrap things up, and then you'll, you'll all be brought in. But have fun getting to know each other. Head out into those breakout rooms and enjoy yourself. If you have questions, hit up Dan or hang out in the room, and we'll talk. So here we go. All right, so Dan's getting some water and I just uh, started the recording again so that we can see everybody enter back into the main room. Uh, we're gonna spend a little bit of time just talking about their input on, uh, on what makes for a great um, learning environment. And then we're gonna dive into uh, some more content. So let's see, we've got uh, time to close the rooms and they'll have one minute to get back in here. And the time, timer countdown timer is going right now for one minute. We'll get a sense of how great their conversations were by how fast they come back. Right. The that. fact that people aren't coming in right now. Uh -huh, that's a good sign. All right. Welcome back. When's the race? Yeah. So Megan, I've been thinking about your biology uh, challenges since last week. There's, and I'll, I'll show you some pretty cool Google slide things, but you'll have to go and find a frog to, to part out, but you can do an online. Uh, oh, I don't do dissections anyway. That's not, that's AP bio and I don't teach that. <laughs> well, you could do frog parts. That's true. A lot that's not in the standards. <laughs> We're gone. All right, welcome back everybody as people are coming back in. 
uh, want to, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time just talking about your discussion about what makes for a great uh, learning environment. And when, as we do that, I want to make sure that you see the, the uh, fruit of your labors. So I'm going to share the screen. This, th again, this is a uh, app, a polling software called Mentimeter. Really, really great because of the variety of questions you can do. This open-ended ones are, are fun. So as this is, you'll see that this is scrolling and this is all the stuff that you put in while you're out there. What are you noticing about what makes for a great learning environment? And this would be where you unmute yourself and, and comment. Connection. Yeah. A lot of connection there. Fun. I'm also seeing a lot of engaging or engagement up there. So as we are, we look at these things, it's, it's fun, it's engaging, it's interactive. I think safe is a, is a big one in there as well. If we could take these things that, that make for a great learning environment and make the, our virtual spaces these things, that's what, you guys know what makes for great learning and a great learning environment. And the idea is how do you translate those into the virtual space? And I'm excited about um, sharing some of these things with you. The, but I also want to be careful about what you take away from here. It's important. We're going to show you a whole bunch of stuff. And a lot of people, their first response is that it's overwhelming. Wow, there's a lot here. And then it's, oh my gosh, there's a lot here. My there's not limiting, it's not a limiting factor. There's a ton of stuff I could be doing. And if you're like me, as soon as I notice the possibilities, I want to do all the possibilities. So uh, in this, I've been doing online learning since 2007, 2008 through webinars in the corporate world, and then helping design all that kind of stuff. And every time I see new possibilities, I want to cram them all into every interaction. So don't chase shiny things. You're gonna see a lot of shiny things today, but remember, don't start with the tool, start with the outcome. What do you wanna get done? You wanna start with creating this great learning environment, start there and start with, wow, this, this exercise I did in class was really wonderful. How do I make that happen in the simplest way possible uh, in, in a virtual context? So again, It'll be a little bit overwhelming. Some of you will see brand new things you didn't know uh, were possible through Zoom or any virtual environment. But when you step back and start to design uh, and, and create your, your lesson plans, keep it simple and use the right tool for the job. And before we jump in, I'm gonna toss it over to Mr. Miller. Dan is going to do an important piece in virtual and that is movement. You guys know that your brain can only handle as much as your butt can endure, and even more so in the virtual environment. So I try and every, every 30 minutes or so, create some sort of movement opportunity. Whether it has significance or not, the significance is that you're getting blood back to your brain. So Dan, share with us something that we can do uh, to get us moving. Sure. Can you stop sharing screen for a second? And okay. I want to encourage folks to get into gallery mode so we can see each other for this particular movement activity. And if you don't know how to get into gallery mode, it's it, if you're not there already, it'll look like nine dots on the right hand corner, top right hand corner of your zoom screen. And then you can see everybody and then hold on. I just happen to have an instrument over here. So I'll bust that out and we're going to do a little dance party. Um, you don't have to unmute yourselves if you don't want to, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to get a little tune going and then I'm going to call on somebody who's going to lead us, right? They're going to start the movement. Maybe it's just a little bit of that. Maybe it's a head bob, whatever. And they're going to do that movement for like 20, 30 seconds. And then they're going to unmute themselves and say who the next leader is going to be. 
we'll do this for like a minute or two with no point other than to move our bodies and have a little fun. Uh, so I'm going to start the tune and Jonathan Gibson, I'm looking at you to start us off on our, our little dance routine. When you get done leading your movement, call on somebody else to take over. Okay. That's all the instructions. Here we go. Come on, everybody. You gotta join me, right? Okay. Okay, Cheryl. Stop it there. <laughs> nice job, everybody. Good job, y'all. Thank you. Yeah. So let's um, let's let's talk about what tools are available to you within Zoom. So you don't even have to go outside of Zoom to access these tools. And there's a ton of them uh, that are internal. Some of them are really great. Some of them not so much. Uh, the uh, first one is just your, your camera. And that's what we just did. Just using your camera to create engagement and interaction. Dan didn't switch screens. He didn't ask people to do anything other than look in their camera. And there's a ton of different things. In fact, we were kind of doing it before where I was trying to point at Dan and you figure out, okay, let's figure out where everybody is on the screen uh, and figure out how to do claps and things like that. So that's a fun thing to do. Uh, if you want to engage people or, you know, say, who is, uh, who am I pointing at right now on your screen? Who am I pointing at? I'm pointing at Brandon and I'm, uh, am I pointing at, uh, nobody, <laughs> nobody I'm pointing off to the side in my world, I'm pointing at Megan. So that is, that's one tool that you can use, use your imagination. We're going to, I'm just going to show you these tools and then you figure it out. Another one is uh let's go to let's go to participant feedback and i'm going to share my screen this is my zoom screen and again this is a setting in your in your meeting settings you can there's settings that you can choose up here the green shield takes you to your settings uh your browser settings but also before you do meetings you can go in and choose to be able to show your zoom screen when you're sharing screen Otherwise, you'll, you would just see my home screen and nobody wants to see that, the mess that is my desk. Maybe. So let's look at, first of all, these are nonverbal. Some people already get the reactions. Can you see my cursor down at the bottom of your screen? Reactions. Uh, I love the fact that Zoom just gives positive reactions. You can get a hand clap and everybody gets to see the hand clap for five seconds. Or you can do a thumbs up. I used this when I was leading, I was uh, producing a group that did Robert's Rule of Order. So we had to do seconds and we had to do uh, voting. And instead of, you know, because you couldn't see everybody on the screen, that was one way to do it, is to do this reactions that stayed on for five seconds. Another way to do these reactions is if you pull up the participants window, now you guys have something I don't have. You guys get the raise hand. So when you raise your hand, go ahead. If you have found the participant screen, raise your hand. And notice this. So in your participant screen, you see the raised hand. But do you see it in their windows? Do you see raised hand like on mine? Yeah. Yeah, so you get to see my screen. Here, I'll stop share for a second. Now in the, in the gallery view, do you still see the hands? Yeah. So this is, a, you know, if, if they don't have the, uh, the participant view open, it doesn't necessarily get in the way of what you're doing. And you can go down here and you can say, you can either go individually as are asking questions. I'll say, Ginger, we got that covered. I'll lower your hand or you can clear all and they're all gone. Again, another setting in your um, browser, your settings, 
All these down here at the bottom, you can choose to have as many or as few of these nonverbal interactions as you want. So if you could do a poll questions just without even going to polling and say, all right, uh, have, you, um, have you ever uh, been more than 100 feet underwater? Anybody? You raise your hand or you can do yes or no, do those things. Mr. Walter, I'm pretty sure you've been much deeper than that, safely. If you're a scuba diver, you know that 120 is the safe limit for uh, uh, recreational scuba divers. Now notice, I can look here and try and count, or I can look down here and I can look, oh, three people have and five people have not. So I can get my count right there. So this, these whole verbal, the, the interactions and nonverbal feedback, uh, notice that there's the three buttons. Here's a general rule in most apps, but specifically in Zoom. Wherever you see three dots, that's probably, if you can't find something, that's probably where it is. So if you need coffee, you can ask for coffee. Although it says, I think it needs, needs a break. I think we all know that it just means coffee. So you can put that up there. Clear them all. So what else can you do? Let me move this off. Chat. We've talked about chat before, and most of you kind of know how to use chat. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to go into the chat, open it up here at the bottom, and it here's the chat room. And I want you to do this. I'm going to stop sharing in just a second. And I want you to, in just a moment, not yet, I want you to type in what song defined your childhood. Type it in, but don't hit enter. Type it in, but don't hit enter. What song defined your childhood? Open up chat and uh, don't hit enter yet. Just let it sit there. I'll let you contemplate that. All right, on the count of three, I want everybody to hit enter and we'll see what songs come up. One, two, three, go. Row, row, row your boat, wow. Okay, Weird Al, just so you know, Weird Al has a wonderful uh, Hamilton Polka five minute yes. mashup. Yes. I love that. What else? I just want to. I just want to validate, Allison. That was a really hard question. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, made you think. My my apologies. <laughs> Don't stop me now, Queen. Oh wow! I'm with you, Jonathan. Jesse's girl. Knocking on heaven's door. We've got some. We got some generational differences here too. I saw Brandon. Got, Brandon, are we talking the Guns and Roses version or yeah. the original? Oh, no, Brandon's going go, GNR. Yeah. yeah. Did Brandon <laughs> even know that Bob Dylan did that one? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> That's right. So another cool thing that uh, that Zoom does in the chat. This is a great way to get people into different documents and, and scenes. If you were here when we first started off, I pasted a link in here that brought you to uh, the polling software. And when we go back, I'll post it again so that it's easy for those of you who weren't here to get back into it. But I also created a, uh, a shared agenda. And I'm gonna post that link here. It's a Google Doc. And this kind of, it not only does it give you a roadmap for where we're going, but there's also links in that Google Doc that'll take you to some great resources, uh, including some, uh, uh, some e-books on, uh, on virtual activities that you can do. So if you can open that up if you want, but that's, uh, Zoom took that feature down for a while when they were struggling with security issues. And Thanks, Dan. They, they reinstated it and, I got caught, this is another one of those Zoom fails when I thought, oh, I can just put the link in the, in the chat box and guess what, it was down for like, like three weeks. And then it was a wonderful, when they got back to Zoom 5.0 or whatever it was, they put that back in. So that's chat function. Now you've already seen the, me sharing screens and I wanna show you what that looks like for me and some things about sharing screens that could be helpful for you.
say, first of all, I'm going to, I'll show you my share screen. So down at the bottom, you can click shared screen and you can set it up. So only you as the host can share screen, which I know might be important for high school and middle school teachers. Uh, you can limit that. Uh, or you can have it so that everybody can share the screen. Uh, this is what it comes up. Now, because I'm a geek, I have three monitors. Screen one, screen two, and screen three. What's up on the top there? If you only have one monitor, you'll have one of those screens. And that's it. But up here are the, your monitors. Whiteboard, you can share, create a whiteboard that everybody can contribute to. Thing I love about Zoom, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you can share that. And it, it's not like you're using it as your camera or anything. It's actually just like a shared screen. And if you like have, if you do a lot of work in the iPhone, iPad world, I, when I'm presenting to large crowds at conferences, I'll do my iPad as my presenter. And it turns into a nice flip chart that everybody can see. I can go through all my slides, all my images, just by sharing an iPad. If you are used to, if you're addicted to whiteboards and, um, and like graphically representing in moment what you're doing, having an iPad and doing that creates a nice clear visual. Uh, the whiteboard, in just a second, I'll share the, the Zoom whiteboard and you'll see why uh, I don't like using that. Uh, but it's there, it's there and you can use it. Now down below, if you only have one monitor, you can just share whatever window is open. Now you can see I've got, uh, I've got seven windows open right now. And if all I wanna do is share one of these windows, I can do that. And that way I'm just sharing that window and it saves a lot of space on my, uh, on my visual space on my single monitor if that's what I'm doing. So that's how you share. And I'm sure some of you got that. Now the great part is when you share, let's do whiteboard first and I'll show you what's a better option than whiteboard. So I'm gonna share the whiteboard and now it's up and all you can see is the whiteboard. You can choose how you view on the, on the right hand side, you can still do gallery view or speaker view. And now all of your annotation tools come up. I'm not that good with a mouse. So if I'm trying to draw something, unless I have some sort of a tablet, it's, it looks like that, which isn't much different than my normal writing. So go ahead and just play here just for a minute and get a feel for the whiteboard experience in Zoom. Uh, you should all have permission. Oh, you know what? I think I need to give you all permission again. Uh, Let's see, allow participants to annotate and go ahead. I'll show you that feature as well, which is really important about permissions for annotation. Anybody having trouble finding the annotation tools? Uh, it doesn't seem to be working. You're on screen share. So we're seeing your screen instead Good of your point. Whiteboard. Good point. Nobody wants You've to You've got to that. go under your view options, even though he's in, there we go, screen share. Oops, see, you lost it. Yeah. Go back to sharing the whiteboard, John. <laughs> All right. So. You have to go under your view options to pull up your annotate joy booth. Yeah. On the, on the drop down screen up at the top of yours, you can pull down the annotation stuff. Somebody's on stamps which are cool. Now the thing with text, which is really interesting is that uh, you can't see, or nobody else can see your text until you hit enter or click on another part of the screen. Um, th these area, era, uh, arrows that Elizabeth has up there in um, WebEx, you, everybody gets an arrow at the same time. In Zoom, if I chose to use the arrow again, let's see if I can find it. Um, if, I choose, if I chose to use the arrow, It'll take Sandy's name off. Oh, now we're having a battle. So if you use an arrow, it'll take somebody else's off. There is a feature that is uh, where you can show names of annotators and it stays up for five seconds. Once you annotate something, uh, it'll show up for five seconds of who wrote what. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, well, okay. Let me show you this. Uh, over with the controls. 
I can disable participant annotation, which is really crucial if you want to get anything done after you're done with your annotation section. So I can stop. Now nobody can annotate. I can clear everything. And we can move on. So I was uh, early, this was back in March, a very well known and very respected experiential <laughs> leader was doing her first zoom course with about 400 people. She didn't know about that, that uh, limiting about stopping annotation features. And so being that she was working with a bunch of fellow educators that were acting like their worst participants ever, they would, she would clear it and it would be full again, clear it, be full again. And so it was a great revelation to her that you can take away that right. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of control that you have over participant options uh, by clicking on the three dots wherever you find them or clicking on the, um, the green shield. You've got a lot of control in the moment if you wanna do that. Let's talk about another shared screen piece. I'm gonna share my, this is a power, just a PowerPoint. And this is, again, getting a little bit outside of Zoom. But this is why I prefer using a different, whether it's PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever. You can go ahead. I'm going to give you guys permission to annotate again. And you can go ahead and just play here. And if let's say like I wanted people to vote on what are you most curious about? What does that icon mean? And what I want you to do is take a check mark out of the stamps in your annotation. Or you can circle it. <laughs> um, but take a check mark, circle it. What are you most curious about learning? Why would I put that icon up there uh, for, for learning tools inside of Zoom? Somebody really loves the whiteboard. There's a lot of checks and hearts for the people sitting around the table or breakout rooms. And sharing screen is uh, where the single check mark is. So again, Think about what you might want to do with perhaps if you're teaching uh, geography, you can put a map up there and have them, uh, you know, put in the capitals or, or you can put different parts in there. Now here's, I'll get that another piece of that later. Uh, specifically sharing specifically with iPhone. Okay. Uh, I don't have my, my pad in here, but Maybe after, when this is all done, I'll, we can get into the meta section of understanding. We can ask some of these questions and how to. So that is, that is some annotation stuff, share screen. Now polls. Zoom polls has one option. I don't, didn't create any. The, the reason why I have a challenge, I'm challenged with Zoom polls is because you have to create all your polls before the meeting starts. And the only type of question you can ask is a multiple choice question. It's really simple. If it, it's really simple to get to, so if all you want to do is a really simple multiple choice, use Zoom polling because it'll 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 keep people ever young. Remember, don't chase the shiny object. Uh, if you can get away with doing Zoom polls, do Zoom polls, and I'll show you where that lives. So Zoom polls, down here, you'll notice that I have, as the host, I have more options down here. And one of those is polls. If you click on this, on the polls, if you have a poll design, um, it, it'll, you, I click to add question and it takes you to, um, I, I'm typing gibberish in my poll software right now. and save. Now all of a sudden there's a question up there. I haven't launched it yet, but this is, this is just what it looks like. I can launch the poll and now it should be on your screen. I'm gonna stop sharing. You guys see the poll? Give me whatever you got. Give me an answer in there. <laughs> So this is what it looks like as I'm doing the poll. This is what it looks like on my screen. I, I am, I'm watching in real time, both number and percentages. So if you want to take a pulse of your, either a true false question or what do you want to do right now? Or those types of multiple choice, you can, 
um, create it beforehand, and then it's not as awkward as you saw me kind of jump out to create a question. End polling, and now I see the results, and I can control whether I, whether I show these or not. Let's just say it's something that you want to keep for your information. You don't have to show it, but I can share the results, and now they show up on your screen. So that's the polling. John, we got a quick question that I actually don't know the answer to. Is, is polling uh, available in the free version of Zoom? No, it's not. Cool. Great question. All right. So I'm going to back to sharing. And here's a really interesting, uh, interesting tool. And depending on how much you trust your people, I can, right now I'm sharing my screen, right? I can give permission for somebody to take over my mouse. You can see why this is risky. Here's everybody here, everybody who's in the room. And I can say, all right, uh, just for kicks, I'm gonna give, uh, I, is it, how do you say your name? Cheetan, Cheetan, where's the, where's the uh, accent? From India. <laughs> All right, you have control of my mouse right now. So if you if you move your mouse around, you'll move my cursor. Is that? Uh... Yeah, you got it. I'm not moving it. Now, when might this be useful? So now the other this okay. So I'm gonna um, remote. I, I want to, let's see, remote, a little bit harsh term here, abort control. So, and now when might this be useful? I'm going to go to a manipulative. This is a, an app called Flippity alongside things. So if I wanted, at this point, I'm going to, um, are you guys seeing my share? Right, not yet. Now are you? Your shared screen seems to have frozen. Yeah. Um, let me see. I here. think it's because is the share paused? Yeah, it was paused. Yeah. Right. That's, right. A, that's yeah. exactly what that function does. It just pauses your screen share wherever it's at and freezes it until you right. do something else. Yeah. So now um, I should be sharing the, the, the manipulative screen. This is an app called flippity.net, and you can create all your stuff. How many? Give me a thumbs up if you have used flippity.net before. Okay. And I love the mix of people using the reactions and using the, their analog thumb as well. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to give people control of my mouse. Um, let's see, Megan, I'm going to give you control. And I want you to just go ahead and select one of those things that you're curious about. Or you can say, all right, this is, I, I do work in organizational development. So let's talk about group process. How would you, those words, how would you put in, how would you um, sequence those? So you can move your cursor and just pick one, move it up to the top, move them around. Look, no hands. Now, now Megan and I are, are fighting over control of the cursor. <laughs> so go ahead, you got it, one last one. Okay. So you'll notice that's um, one of the challenges is that um, when you, you, I still have control of the cursor, but I've shared it with somebody else. And so if I want it back and she doesn't want to give it back, then you have a little bit of a tug of war going on. So, John, while I was controlling your screen, I tried unmuting myself, but couldn't. Because you have mine. Right. So, is there no way to change that? Um, I, don't, I think that because you have control of my cursor, you're, the only movements that you're getting on, on for, are my machine. Okay. So, you wouldn't be able to unmute yourself. What you'd ask people to do is unmute yourself before you give them control. Or, okay. if you're dealing... I'd say in a classroom situation, you may want to say, hey, everybody unmute yourself. We're going to do some uh, manipulatives here. So, all right, then we'll do one more, uh, one more Zoom 
feature inside of Zoom, and this is one I think a lot of people are curious about, and that is the breakout rooms. So breakout rooms are wonderful, especially if, if I, I'm sure none of you have oversized classes where there's more people than you can really manage or create some intimate connection. None of you have that. Uh, but if you do, what you can do is down at the bottom, there's a thing called breakout rooms. And in the breakout rooms, you can see we already created breakout rooms and uh, when we did it the first time. So it automatically creates breakout rooms. You can actually do them on your own where down here before you, uh, when the first time you do it, it'll say create rather than recreate. And I can choose to, uh, we've got 16 people, four rooms assigned, so there's four people per room. Or I can do it manually and then I can place people in those four rooms. I, if you know your class, you can actually do this beforehand and it goes really quick. When you have a producer, uh, somebody working with you, make them the host and then they can set up your uh, breakout rooms for you. And if you have specific people, let's say like you have people who are facilitators in, in, in your class, you can make sure that there's a facilitator in each room. Options. Uh, I can, I, I gave you guys a choice of, you got to go into the breakout rooms whenever you wanted. If I wanted to force you in them right away, I can click that. Uh, and then as soon as I uh, opened all the breakout rooms, you guys would go in there. I, that could be useful with students. With adults, I like to give them the option to hang out with me in the main room if they have questions before they go out there. It seems to be helpful. Again, this is a tool that you can use on purpose. If you wanted to limit the time of breakout rooms, the countdown uh, I set for 60 seconds. So I give you one minute, you'll get an, a, a, an alert and a countdown up on the top of your screen that says how many seconds until you're, you come back in. You can always add an additional room. And what I wanna do in just a moment is we're gonna move on to the next part. So take a deep breath and I want you, before we move on to looking at tools alongside Zoom, I want you to write down two or three things you noticed or that you that, that kind of caught your attention about tools inside of Zoom. Um, what did you become aware of? It could be something brand new or it could be something that you already knew about that you have a new insight about. Just take a couple of moments and write down something if you got some scratch paper. If not, just write on your desk and then erase it later like you have to do in the classroom. John, can I ask a quick question about breakout rooms? Sure. Do you know if it's possible to do like a hybrid between manual and automatic populating of them? Like, can you manually put a facilitator in each room and then have everybody else dispersed randomly? Um, or one or the other? I would, I would flip it and I would say, uh, uh, randomly disperse everybody else and tell your facilitators not to go. And then you can actually place them on, you can, uh, that's a great question because I'll share my screen again. And when they're in the rooms, you can see that I can move people to different rooms or I can exchange people. And I, I've, I've done that before where I, I had my facilitators stay out and then I just put them in the rooms that I wanted them in. Is that what you meant? Yeah. John, another point in that is that when you create breakout rooms, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't launch the rocket. So you can create the breakout rooms and look at what you've created see where everybody's at, move them around, and then open the rooms. And that's really, that's a hybrid option like you're talking about. Yeah. And a lot of these things, again, what we're trying to hear is give you an idea of what's possible. And then if you're interested, we could, um, like there's a whole, I did a whole hour and a half session on using breakout rooms. And there's the difference between orientation and how to, we're orienting and giving you ideas. And then, and this is a quick bonus material, the best advice I ever got about virtual learning was from 2009 or 10. I went to a webinar manifesto workshop the thing that these guys, they wrote a book on webinars and they said, learn the platform, read all the material they have, and then break it, break it to your will, make it do what you want it to do. Not what they say it can do. Um, they're trying to get you to use it. And as a matter of fact, I, I, if you ask zoom or you ask WebEx, or if you ask teams, they will say, never go outside of their, their platform. But as soon as you start to, and we're gonna to go uh, to the next section here, 
as soon as you go outside the platform, all kinds of possibilities uh, become, it all, it all becomes possible. So what can you use alongside Zoom? And what I mean by the, what we talked about before are all tools within Zoom. The couple of them, we got into a couple alongside things, but if you start to think, man, if I, instead of using Zoom uh, polls, I use something like Poll Everywhere or Mentimeter, uh, that expands the possibilities. And that's what I'm hoping to do is now we're going to go into you, hopefully like, oh my gosh, look at annotating a PowerPoint slide. Lots of possibilities there. Um, sharing the, sharing the uh, remote control is really cool, but what if everybody had access to the same thing at the same time? And you could have your whole class all interacting on the same, uh, in the same screen. So that's what we're talking about alongside Zoom. Uh, let me, before we do that, um, I want to show you what we used. Uh, some of you saw this before, and I got to get to the right screen. I showed you the manipulative board, and it's a program called Flippity.com. What I love about Flippity is that uh, you get to create all your own stuff, all the stuff that you want. I'll show you the, their flippity.net, uh, flippity I believe it's called. And look at all these op opportunities for, this is designed for classrooms. I use this, uh, we'll use the Flippity randomizer in just a minute, but you can create your own Jeopardy style uh, quiz. Uh, this Flippity randomizer, the first thing I thought of is this is a great tool for um, improv. Now, Dan, didn't you use the randomizer for something or am I thinking of somebody else? Did I ever? I used it to make a wheel of consequences. Yeah. You, want to, you want to see it? Yeah, show us the wheel of consequences. Let's yes, see. please. Uh, hold on, oh, it might've gone to sleep. Uh, that's okay, I can make it again. All right. It won't take long, I'll, I'll, right, here I'll we go. Sure. You nope, it only took that. that, it only took that long to make my wheel of consequences. There you go. Yeah, so I, uh, I do a lot of like games and initiatives and I'm really into having real consequences and not just being cheesy. Like, okay, we played the game, that was fun. So uh, if you, and I like setting up people for failure. I think that's an important thing to learn about in life. So when I set them up with a hard activity and they fail, then they go to the wheel of consequences and they have to spin it and see what happens. This is by far the worst consequence I know. <laughs> yeah, jaws dropping. <laughs> but uh, you know, I might come up with a way for them to earn those ten minutes back uh, if they if they really perform well. But yeah, whenever they fail at a mission or whenever I just feel like you know having some fun, tape on your face. Why not? I'll show you one more, and I'll give it back to John. Thirty seconds of dancing. That's not so bad. Yeah, flippity is so easy and and can be ridiculously fun. Yeah, and so. The, that works off of Google Sheets. And what you do, you'll, you'll uh, download the template and then you, in Google, you put in all the different things that you want in there. Uh, the, the name randomizer isn't just a name randomizer. You can do questions, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but it's really kind of, and they do all the magic. You fill in the boxes, you click a button, and all of a sudden you have access to a great uh, website that everybody can see and, and access independently. So if you did a breakout room, you uh, put the link to that site into the breakout room. Um, whoever opened that up in their browser has control over that. So you could, you could combine this with breakout rooms and you know, give them a refrigerator magnet manipulative on whatever task that you want them to do. Um, do the randomizer, the, the, um, the little spinner thing. You can even create scavenger hunts in there. So a lot of cool things that you can do there in Flippity. Um, Let's go to, I showed you the PowerPoint, how to use PowerPoint. I wanna show you one more thing that you can do in PowerPoint that's pretty, uh, pretty cool that not many people know about. So right now I'm sharing the screen. Are you guys, are you guys seeing the, the alongside Zoom PowerPoint screen? Good. Now, if I wanted to create some movement without building in annotations, I can say, all right, let's really focus on uh, 
flippity. Or let's, you know what, there's some outdoor, there's some outside polling software that we can use. Now you might be saying, John, what kind of wizardry is this? I know that's what you're thinking. I'll show you what I'm doing. Uh, and you guys get to see the very rarely shared uh, program screen that I'm using. So I'm, this is what I use to manage all this stuff. Now this is, all this is, is the PowerPoint editing screen that you have up when you're doing your, your show. Now, all I do to get the movement is I move these while the show is going and they show up on the show screen as magically moving around. So I like, I like that. Let's talk about, I wanna show you the, you, we've already played in Mentimeter. So I wanna show you guys what that looks like and, and why I like it so much. Now, again, don't, um, yeah, Magic of Multiple Monitors, it is about, uh, Dan shared that, uh, it's about, if you only have one monitor, it's about how do you manage your, your, your space on that one monitor. Doing windows, separate windows for everything is really helpful. Because uh, you, you can still do it, uh, you can still do that kind of a thing with the show and all that kind of stuff with a single monitor. Um, we got a new participant here. Glad he can make it. What's, what's his name, Chitan? His name's Azai. Azai. Hi, Azai. Hello, Azai. Hi, Azai. <laughs> We're glad you're here, buddy. So let's take a look at the Mentimeter screen. And again, um, what I was going to say before is it doesn't matter. There's a lot of great polling software out there. You might know of um, Poll Everywhere or uh, the two that I know of, Poll Everywhere and Mentimeter are really powerful. What I like about these over Zoom is you have a lot of additional questions you can ask. So if I, let me add a slide here. And now you look at all these options I have. Multiple choice, of course. Word cloud, this is a great tool to use if you want to take the temperature of the room or find out what's important, uh, what are they thinking about. I've got a word cloud I set up for you guys uh, up here about uh, uh, three words that would you use to describe virtual uh, learning. Uh, I didn't show it just because we wanted to get into everything. Again, um, scales. If you know uh, about Likert scales, then uh, uh, you can use these for that same thing. I use it for evaluations all the time. Uh, uh, how much do you agree with the statement, scale of one to five or scale of one to 10? You can choose those things. Ranking. It, when I'm working with a group and I want to find out what's important to them, I, I have objectives. The objectives are usually set by myself and whoever's in charge, but I want to hear from the people who actually show up to the meeting what's important to you. I'll put them in and then you get a chance to rank them by importance. Q&A is a new function that they have that where if you notice when you do a poll, you, we're going to be doing a poll in just a minute here. At the bottom, there's a thing of asking a question. They'll all get collected. Uh, if you look here on the screen on the ask me anything question. So when we're done, if there's questions, I'll do a, I'll do a, let's say I do a big conference. And instead of using the chat function, they can use uh, Mentimeter. Two things. One, uh, you can collect the chats but they come in a text file that's really awkward to make usable. Here, when you're done, when we're done with this, we're gonna take all of our, the input that you gave me, turn it into a PDF, and everybody's gonna get access to all of your ideas. So when you guys are putting in what makes uh, learning great, you guys will get all these ideas around what makes an engaging learning environment. Couple of more things about it. Like I said before, you can go here, you can create a QR code. This was designed for conferences. So in a live conference, they can get on this and, and interact on their phone. I copied the link and I put it into the chat box. For those of you who don't have this, the link to this, now, now you do. Um, oops, I just sent it to Cheryl. Just Cheryl, sorry about that. Um, there we go. So now in the chat, this link is there and it's that easy that they have access uh, access to the, um, to the polling software. 
And again, I said, I can download this at the end. So what else can we use outside or, or alongside of Zoom? I shared, uh, shared documents. If you want people to interact at the same time, uh, here's a Google uh, Slides. All I've got to do is I'm going to go into Google Slides. I'm going to copy, get a link. Notice the settings here. Anybody, anyone in the internet with this link can edit it. Uh, if uh, you, you keep this link close to your chest, then uh, you don't have to worry about people bombing it. I'm going to put it into the chat. And I'll do what I did when we started. As a matter of fact, uh, right now, you, you should, if you click on that, you'll be able, and I see people, if you notice at the top here, when you send them a link, they'll be able to participate anonymously. So you have anonymous badger, a uh, Python, that's cool. Um, there's anonymous skunk. Most people aren't too thrilled with being anonymous skunk. And now you can say, what I want you to do is I want you to grab uh, the, a text box and uh, just put your initials where you're, where you're uh, joining us from. And for those of you who are in schools that use Google Docs and Google Classroom, this is brilliant because they can all have their own screen that they're working on, or you can do group work uh, with it. Um, and, the, and the best part is you don't have to teach them to use Google Slides or Google Docs. They already know how to do it, and now you can do whatever you want. So great to see people joining from all over the place. You'll notice I also keep a world doc here, our, our world map. Now, important to realize, if I would just put this, uh, this US map in as a graphic or as a picture, then you guys would be able to move it around. Anybody wanna try and move around that United States map? Can't do it. It's a background. Sorry to disappoint you, Jonathan. Uh, use your backgrounds. If you want to create a format that your students can't move, do that as a picture and then use that picture as a background. And then you can create a play field with boundaries and perimeters that they can't move, but they can move everything else. Here's another challenge. I'm going to switch, uh, switch slides here. And again, um, if you go move down to the third slide, you see a nail puzzle. Anybody ever do nail or matchstick puzzles? This is a great critical thinking tool. What you need to do is turn around this fish by moving three nails. This is how you do it. Anybody who's in here, if you move down, if you click on a nail, guess what? You can move it. Um, what you're going to want to do, Helen, is turn off your uh, uh, annotation tool. And then you'll be able to, uh, or, or you go to the mouse tool in your annotation settings. Now look at this mess that we're creating. Oh my gosh, we're going to have to figure out who's going to move what when. But yeah, you I think we've see, already moved like 12 pieces. Yeah. Um, they might have to go to the wheel of consequences for this one. <laughs> um, but imagine, this is when I, so Megan last week told me that she was a biology teacher. And immediately, I've got a bio, uh, one of my undergrad degrees is in biology. And I thought about, wouldn't this be great if you got individual pictures of frog parts and put them into a frog? You make this, you put this in your Google Classroom so that, that your, if you created a, a teams or group work, each group of three have to do a frog dissection and move it out and then perhaps put something into a document. Oh, there's another thing, a shared document. So right now I'm sharing, um, I'm sharing the, uh, this is Google Slides. I want to share uh, the Google Doc that I put up. Actually, let me go to a different one. I made, I'm not using this just because we don't, we do have limited breakout rooms, but I'm going to share this and this we all can edit. I'm see. So I'm going to grab the share, copy link, 
Everybody, oh, everybody can view. I would have, I need to change this from everybody can view to everybody can edit. Now, when I share this link in chat, everybody can go in here. And if you do a breakout room and you want the breakout rooms taking notes, I create a guide for each breakout room. And now if you're in here, you can go in and add to this document. We use this in corporate meetings all the time for agendas to capture what tasks we need to do. Here's another piece. As you guys are, are editing this anonymously, if you wanna make sure that people, uh, you see their names or they're, they're annotating as themselves, if it's for class credit, instead of just sending them the link, as you guys are doing this, I will, when you share, it's gonna say, you can add everybody's email. So in Google Classroom, if they're already part of that group, you give them editing access, then they participate as themselves and not anonymously. Making sense? Um, so share, share slides, polling, got that. One thing, there's a bunch of, um, whiteboards or, or collaboration tools that are alongside as well. Google, if you're using Google Docs and Google Classroom, you have a ton of options. Even Google Draw in there is, is pretty cool for sharing. I also use, um, let me see if I can get to the right spot. I use, a, I use an app called uh, Mural. And th that's more of a, a consultant tool, but there's some free apps that you can find that are more useful. Let's see, mural. There's, there's some uh, better whiteboarding apps that are all about collaboration. And nobody look at my, my sign in. Try that again. I can show a little jam board while you're getting on there if you want. Um, let me try one more time. The program he's about to show you is awesome. And right now they're doing a 90 day free trial because of COVID. So if you get onto it and like write their tech support, they'll give you an extra 60 days of free for use. Yeah. So I created this for a group that I'm working with and it's all, a lot of this stuff is pre-made. So like they can't move it, but they can do like, um, here I pre-made this guide to practice groups and these are post-it notes. Um, we can go in here and these are some of the ways that it's a mural playground. So you can connect things and move them around, add pictures, add icons. And if you're doing group work or collaboration, it's a really helpful, uh, uh, really helpful to be able to be in there at the same time and do brainstorming. Uh, this one, you'll notice we did a, a typical design approach where we start off with brainstorming. They put post-it notes in here. They move them over here to an importance versus feasibility grid. Uh, and they got a chance, this is a way to prioritize. Once we found out what was important and feasible, we moved them up to an exercise called the platonic triangle. All those post-its started off at the bottom and they had to come up with which one makes it to the top. And so this group actually designed their own process by doing that. So let me, I'll stop sharing for a second. And there's one more thing I wanna share, you, share with you alongside. And that's um, the, the Jamboard. Jamboard is again, one with it, that is within Google. And if you've ever done, let's see, if you've ever done word circle puzzles, then this is one way, there's lots, you can do it in slides, but this is one way that I've done it. I've just invited you all to this Jamboard. If you go in, you go to Jamboard number four, and you can move around. The idea is you, these are word pairs. 
So you're looking for word pairs to make a circle so that it's a continuous sentence. So you would look at, um, for instance, uh, rain and dance go together. So what word would go with dance, after dance or before rain? Thank you, Anonymous. I don't know what that Arox is. Nice, and that is dance step. Step up. Somebody thought it was step kit. Somebody who owns trucks, I'm guessing. Ooh, uplift. I think people struggle with this one because you think you're looking for those compound words or like two words, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's actually one word. Tenant. Made by, made by two things. Tenant. That's the new Christopher Nolan movie coming out. I'm pretty excited about it. All right. Let's, um, let's move on. I'm going to uh, ask Dan to get us moving again. So oh, Dan, wait. can you give us a quick motion so we can get blood back to our brains? Um, yeah. We just want to play some follow the leader. I don't know. I really actually, I want to, I want to do this one. This, this will be quick. All right. I want everybody to find one person on the screen, just one. And, and I want you to stare at them. They don't know you're staring at them, but you're staring at one person. And then when I say go, you're going to do two things. You are going to make a, a pose. You're going to strike a pose. And at the same time, you're going to be watching that one person you've already selected. And whatever pose they do, you're going to change your pose to be what their pose is. And we're just going to see what happens. All right. So first step, choose one person, only one person to pay attention to during this exercise. Second step, when I say go, you bust a move, whatever it is. Third step, you change your move to match the person you're staring at. No time for questions. One, two, three. <laughs> what usually happens with this one is people start settling into like one or two different different little moves. It's pretty fun. Thanks for playing. I think it breaks down if two people pick each other, like Shannon yeah, and I just you did. Get the, you get the loop. Uh huh. That's fine with me. Wheel wheel of consequences. All right. Let's move on to the last section of uh, uh, tools outside of Zoom. And for the most part, the idea is, for those of you who are in the weird learning stuff, you have synchronous learning and asynchronous. What we've been talking about to this point is synchronous, where we're all in the same place at the same time. But a lot of the things that we talked about outside of Zoom, from when we talk about uh, shared document or shared slides, and, and we talk about the polling software, and we talk about uh, shared documents, and even uh, Mural or the outside collaboration software, those are all open 24 seven. So if you wanted to do a test or quiz or a poll in Mentimeter, they, if they have the link, there's a setting in there that it says a participant paste. So you can, you can create a quiz in that where they can do it at their own, they can do it after class whenever they feel the need to. Um, I, I'll do that sometimes. I may do it with you guys where we do, I wanna evaluate, I wanna find out what worked and what didn't for this. So I'll send you a, an evaluation poll that you fill out whenever you want and you get to go through all the questions. Same thing goes if you're using Google Classroom or even um, if you're into Office 365 and Teams, those are all about shared documents. So everybody has access to them if you give it to them whenever they want. So if you have a group project that they're working on, whether it's a slideshow or writing a paper, they have access to those 24 seven. That's the concept of asynchronous programs. So again, I don't have to share those again, but now you've got in your brain, oh my gosh, it isn't just limited to when I have them on screen. We're gonna go back in the breakout rooms and these are gonna be 
maybe a seven minute breakout room because we're, again, we are having too much fun and ran short on time. But what I want you to do is what insights did you gain? Talk about this. What insights did you gain about learning in the virtual context and then put it into, I've got a polling question in Menti that you can put it into. And we're going to put you out there in just a minute. This is what the, the question will look like. Again, open-ended. You have 150 words and you can submit multiple times. And with that, um, let's go back. Let me stop sharing my fatal flaw. We're going to go back into the rooms and take seven minutes to talk about this and make sure that you post your thoughts into uh, the Menti poll. Before I go, should I, do you guys have access to yourself, Minty, Minty, or should I send it back to you? Uh, I'll, I'll share it again. But make sure you get this uh, before, uh, before you go in, click it, there you go. And then we're gonna go out to those rooms, take a few minutes and just figure it out. What, what has become, what insights have you gained here? So go ahead and head out there. We'll pull you back in in six or seven minutes. All right, so we're recording again. I just I was just telling Dan how much I appreciate having that uh, that producer slash co facilitator in here with me. And again, I needed to follow my own advice and make sure that if I've got more than fifteen or twenty people in a room, I have that backup. Especially, we're not charging for this, but if you're asking people to pay money for you, you better you better um, come through. Yeah, the backup plans are so important in this in this uh, environment. Yeah, because as Dan says, the internet internet is trying to kill you. <laughs> Maybe trying to kill our credibility. Yes. All right, I just uh, closed out the room, so everybody should be coming back in the next minute. Uh, the they're sharing some great stuff. Um, I'll I'll share that screen. Oh, with the Minty. Yeah. I do like this. I have I haven't been totally sold on Menti, but seeing you use it definitely uh, yeah. moves me in that direction. So as people are coming back in, you're getting to see all this great stuff that that you guys are are, are seeing as possibilities. And I'll leave this up just for a minute. And yeah, take you all will be getting copies of this. And you'll be able to pull ideas both from the, the first one where we talked about what makes a great learning uh, environment and then this one, which is specific ideas of what you're walking away with. And in just a few minutes, we're going to wrap this up. And in a few minutes, we're going to open it up to just questions that you might have because we really haven't given it a Q&A yet, but we will. And we've got about another, uh, I've got a little bit of time before my next meeting. So I'll sit as long as I can. And Dan will sit as long as he can to help answer you guys' questions. But I want you to think about this, and this is kind of a, a closure activity. And you guys, as, as teachers know, closing uh, an activity isn't about me telling you what you are supposed to get. It's you thinking about what you actually got out of this session. And I want you to think about this. I'm going to walk through some of the things we talked about. And I want you to answer this question that I've ripped off from Walt Waldo Emerson. He used to greet people by saying, what has become clear to you since last we met? Can't exactly walk by that one. That one, it's an engaging question. I wanna ask you, what has become clear to you in the last 90 minutes? And it could be like, I don't like sitting for 90 minutes, or it could be something about using the virtual environment, whatever it is. I want you to take a moment as I walk through what we did, what has become clear to you through this process? And we started off just talking about some of the outcomes and goals, and really we need to orient ourselves to this tool because we have such high expectations that we beat ourselves up for not being great right away. But you need to have, you need to learn, you need to have that learning curve. And that's what this orientation is about. It wasn't about learning how to, it's about learning what's possible. And we talked about the tools inside of Zoom where you don't even have to leave Zoom. Using the camera and the screen, 
using the comments, using the nonverbal and the reactions, uh, using polling and whiteboards and screen share. Then we talked about the tools alongside Zoom, like your PowerPoint or Google Docs, Google Slides, Jamboard, uh, the polling software, and, and also the, the collaboration software that's all alongside is synchronous with your Zoom classroom. And being able to allow everybody to participate at the same time on the same Google Docker slide. Then we touched on those same tools uh, asynchronously that between your Zoom or your virtual sessions, you can have people working on shared documents or in collaboration software or even doing tests and polls. And we find ourselves here wrapping things up. And I ask you this question, which is, What has become clear to you? So now that you've had a chance to think a, lot of, a little bit about it, go back to, it should be up on your screen now. You may have to catch up to me a little bit, but share some thoughts about um, what has become clear to you in the last 90 minutes. I'm gonna stop sharing so that uh, you guys might be able to see things better. Oops, did I change it? I changed it on you, didn't I? Now let's try it again. What has become clear to you through this process? Spelling and grammar do not count. I had a botany professor that did all blue book tests and spelling and grammar counted. She was tough. So I'm going to share the screen so that you can see, you can keep on adding things if you want. I'm going to share the screen so that you can see what other people are saying. And as we, we close out the formal part of this, um, to me, it's so important that um, number one, you know, it's possible. Number two, you start to dream about how you translate your great classroom skills into the virtual environment. And number three, that you change from fear and frustration to excitement and possibility thinking. And that ultimately is what I'm hoping for with this. Keep on putting in what became clear. I want you guys to know that um, you can watch, you can attend all these kinds of demonstrations. This again was an orientation, but even watching how-to videos, and you guys probably know this, the only way you're gonna learn this is by practicing it. And you don't want the first time you attempt these things to be your first class. So a couple of recommendations. One, and just because I'm putting them together, I'm gonna to put together what I call guided practice groups where you can get together with edu other educators or other facilitators and try stuff out. I'm gonna do this in August. You can try stuff out in a place where number one, it's focused in guided practice. Number two, you'll get feedback from other uh, professionals. And number three, you'll get master coaching. And they're a five week process where you get a chance to practice with each other, ask questions, share successes and failures. Ultimately what it's about is a, it's an opportunity to suck in a safe place. And if you don't participate in one of the ones that my organization is putting together, put it together with your colleagues. Create just random Zoom things. Hey, can I get you together? I wanna try something out. 
you don't want, again, you don't want the very first time that you try out these tools to be uh, in your classroom. Know that um, technical difficulties are the norm, not the exception. And I know I said that last week and it may have sounded like an excuse for why things were going wrong, but ultimately there's always technical difficulties. And if you think back the first time you walked in the classroom and it wasn't set up the way you wanted, or there weren't uh, re resources available, you saw those as a problem. Now you just see it as every day. And the same thing will happen as you walk through virtual classrooms. The technical difficulties you experience will become the norm and you'll be able to navigate through them rather than freak out. So what I encourage you to do with all this stuff, know that in probably three or four days, I'm going to send you an ebook of our class, of, of our session. So all the ideas, all the stuff that you see, you'll have access to both in ebook form, but also in a recording. We've been recording this. And so if you need to fast forward through and find how did, how the heck he get there? What did he say there? Whatever. That's all going to be part of this. And with that, I want to kind of thank you guys for hanging in there and participating. And I want to, you know, we're a little bit over time, so I wanna make sure that you don't feel like you have to hang out and stay here. But I also wanna to go to what I call the meta section, which is now, uh, there's some questions that you guys have. I see some in chat. I see some in the, in the ask me anything section here, but I want to um, give you guys permission to go or stay, whatever you wanna do. Thank you. And let me know anyway, you guys have my email address. You know how you can contact me. I've got open office hours whenever, if you check out, uh, book a time online. You can see my calendar and you can get on it. You guys have permission to jump into my schedule anytime you want. Helen does this on a regular basis and I love her for it. Um, so uh, with that, let's go to Meta and let's take a look at some of the questions that you have. First of all, on the, let's take a look at the ask me anything stuff. And asking, why did I choose Menti? to push your polls as opposed to other platforms? Great question. And for me, the reason why I choose Menti is because it was the one that I know the best. And I was, you know, Menti and Poll Everywhere, the two that came to mind for me uh, when I first started looking. And I, I, I like the free Menti best because you only got two slides, but you got unlimited participants. Poll everywhere, you had unlimited participants, or I mean, you had uh, multiple slides, but you only got uh, 20 participants on the free version. So it was all about like the bucks uh, when I started this. So I learned that best, and then I just continued on with it. My recommendation is, if, if you know a better, uh, another software that, that, or app that meets your needs, go with it. Uh, what do you know best? Because you don't want to just constantly be in that, I need the best all the time. You get in this comparison mode where you never learn all the tools within one, one uh, program. Um, other thoughts or questions about using one versus another? Is there a better one out there that I should be aware of? Uh, un unmute yourself so we can all have just a little free for all discussion here. The concept I usually think of John is, is structure versus style, you know? So like there's a lot of conceptual things that you're talking about here. Like, it's good to be able to poll people. You know, it's great to be able to have interactive things where people can move stuff around on the screen. And then when you get into style, it's just, how do you want to do that? It's great to engage people. It's great to break things up, but there's a million ways to do it. And, and there really isn't a right one uh, as much as there is the right one that fits you. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts about I that? I think you nailed it earlier when you were talking about don't get um, distracted by the shiny ball, but really think about um, the outcome. I'm trying to remember what your words were, but the outcome, you know, think about the why. What are you trying to aim for? Yeah. So I think this, this next one is a question for everyone. Uh, what did you have for breakfast? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I had coffee and toast with butter on it. And then I have a larger meal um, after this. Anybody I, else? Breakfast? I guess that might be dinner for Chaseon, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where are you calling in, Chaseon? I'm in India. 
Ah, glad you're here. I'm glad I had that world map available if I asked you to put it in there. Um, um, let's see. I have just a quick question. I'm, I'm just I'm also taking this for my grandkids. Is there anybody I can just hire to run some games? And, and, you know, I'm just interested in. Yeah, we, there, uh, there's a whole group of people who are experiential and adventure uh, facilitators like Dan's hand is going up there. Okay. Um, yeah, I like I just want somebody I I just don't have the time to do all the stuff I want yeah. to do. I yeah. do I do one of these with my with my own family, like twenty people okay. on my dad's side of the family once okay. a month. So and I can like we have become closer together. Of course okay. you can. Okay. We become closer together over this than we ever mm -hmm. were before COVID. It's, it's I need shocking. the conductor and the facilitator, and then we'll all <laughs> get on and I mean then we'll learn from you and then probably could do it after that, but just you know, <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll get your Dan is on the emails I sent out to you guys, so you can okay. respond to him. You'll um, hear from me. <laughs> and awesome, yes, Helen. I can, I can guarantee Helen will reach out. Yeah. I, I encourage you guys, um, have a co-facilitator. If you can get a, a buddy to team up with when you're doing your courses, if you're not having to do them at the same time, mm -hmm. and it makes all the difference in the world. Um, and if they have a better, if they're better at one thing than you are, you guys can tag team with each other yeah. and it'll be better for your students. I think we could learn better if we, you know, start it with somebody like Dan, because I mean, I'm, I, I knew a lot of the stuff that you were saying in the first part of Zoom, because now this is like my fifth time, but then when you got on the second and third levels, I only got, you know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> too overwhelming. Yeah. So. Okay, Jonathan, I love your uh, your equation there. Sucking equals learning. <laughs> yeah. Other questions. I got another one up here from the Ask Me Anything. Thoughts on working with participants that may have limited access to virtual worlds, slow connection speeds. How can they engage? Great question. And I want to throw it out there because you guys are probably more expert in that than I am. I've got some thoughts. But what do you think about how can we engage people who have trouble accessing the internet? ditch the internet, go to a park, stand six feet apart, play together. It's still possible. It is. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people think that that's the answer to uh, restarting in-person education is outside. Outside classrooms. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what I'm, that's what I'm planning to do for my class in the fall is mm -hmm. be outside as much as possible. Yeah. I just asked, I gave the idea to a Taekwondo group. I said, why don't you run your sessions outside? I mean, they, they went from inside to Zoom, then back to inside, then got closed in California. And I said, the parks are all wide open. And she said, what a great idea. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. pass that along to my studio. Yeah, I mean, this That's is crazy. The, the parks are wide open here. And nobody's doing anything with kids. And yeah. other states are leaving bike groups. And, yeah. you know. Um, as far as like if you're if you're in a district that isn't allowing that uh, or in a location, I think that part of it is the district needs to be really mindful of the connectivity of their students. And if it's the, there's we had some problems with different locations in our community had different speeds or they couldn't afford the speeds. And so the question become, do you hold everybody back for a few or how do you get the few up with a large group? And I think there's a hybrid in there of, if you know that you have students that have slow connectivity, I would limit the uh, in Zoom stuff and I would do more asynchronous so that they are only having to access one thing at a time at their own speed. And you're trying to find things that aren't, um, aren't like bandwidth hogs like any kind of any kind of video program uses a lot of internet zoom does it better than anything else but like google docs not so much so you know switching to what apps you're using could lower the demand of the speed um, i don't know if your school is doing is doing virtual classroom and there's people who don't have access to the internet that's a that's a problem with the district when you look at a lot of the the schools i mean school they're many, many schools around the world that have been doing virtual education for a long time. But what the trend that you start to see is, is a move towards personalized education because a lot of it is asynchronous and it's not like they're just having big classes on Zoom. They just have assignments 
that that kids do when they can and then they report back to you and and i'm working with a, a private school in texas right now to figure out they were in the middle of revamping their outdoor education program and all this stuff happened and they thought oh well i guess we just can't do this and we kind of pushed back and said well here's here's a list of 20 assignments you can give your kids throughout the year and you only need to check in with them maybe once or twice a week about those assignments so there's a lot of opportunity to to just kind of nudge people into into having experiences that teach them and then doing your job as an educator is sort of pull out what they learned from that experience. And it changes how you use the the, the visual aspects of this. You, you turn your virtual classroom, a, a synchronous virtual classroom into really about connection and relationships. And then you turn them loose and you allow them to do group root work, you know, creating continuing those connections and collaborations into the classwork. Uh, I, I've got a, a six and a half year old son and my and only child, the biggest worry I have is not being able to play with his friends and connect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when this first started, I learned a lot about how to Zoom from him because we would do mm -hmm. Zoom play dates and they don't do Zoom like we do. They don't sit in front of the screen. <laughs> Very first thing they do is, hey, it's my best friend. I'm going to run to my room and get something. And they come back and they play a little bit. Oh, I'm going to run to my room. And they just constant movement uh, and engagement based on the relationship. And they would build Legos together, one would hold it up and they'd go back and forth. And I, th I thought to myself, man, if I can get executives to move that much, they'd be that much more engaged. So that's why a couple, here's some broader tips. Working with, and this is working with adults, I think it's true with, with children. When I'm doing a live workshop, I'm I think in terms of every 15 minutes, I have to change fields, meaning topics or, um, uh, or just move the classroom to get there. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for being here. In the virtual world, every three to five minutes, I want them clicking something, doing something, reading something, talking to something. And it seemed excessive every three to five minutes until I started practicing that and the engagement level skyrockets. Ask them to do a comment, ask them to give a thumbs up, ask them to do something and the engagement increases. The other thing is movement. And I truly believe that you should every, like you guys know that the classes are an hour because of attention span, but also because of bladder control um, for you and the students. So that's every 60 minutes, every 60 to 75 minutes. In the virtual world, you want people moving every 25 or 30 minutes. Get up from their desk, move around. That's why we had Dan come in and do some of those in-screen uh, motion type stuff is so That's why crucial. I have a standing desk. All right. We don't. So you got to remember to ask us to stand. Mm -hmm. um, Simon says becomes a great, uh, a, a great exercise just to, you know, say, Hey, we're going to jump in. Simon says, here's do this, do this, this. I love the, uh, the mirror activity. It's just tons of activities you can do it in camera to get them moving. Uh, and we know the cognitive function increases with motion. We were designed to think while we were walking, not while we were sitting. So uh, other questions or comments before we move on? I would just throw out real quick something similar to what Helen said about the parks. Our, um, I'm in central Virginia and our public libraries actually turned, although they were physically closed, <laughs> Um, they turned their Wi-Fi's on, so when we were still back in the late, um, the early kind of late spring, and still school was in session, our kids that weren't able to get Wi-Fi were physically able to sit in the parking lot and get Wi-Fi, <laughs> which again was just sort of a, a district uh, choice because we have such different bandwidths throughout in you know, our area. Okay, uh, is Allison, Allison still here? Yes, I oh. am still here. Okay, you had a question. Tell me more about your question about, uh, uh, you had a couple questions. Okay. Uh, saving, saving student work. Is there a way to save student work from a screen share, like if uh, share a PowerPoint or a Word doc without using print screen? Yes. Um, it depends on the platform. So uh, Dave, if, you know, oh, go ahead, Allison. Yeah, I think like my issue is, 
more for the younger kids because with the older kids it's easier to send the links in the chat and they can do the google slides or the google docs but with the younger kids the more things you're giving them to navigate like in kindergarten or first grade especially if they're only using like an ipad and they don't have the ability to switch from like one part like one thing to the other if i can have a pdf up on my screen like I've uploaded it into a PowerPoint or something. And then what I've been doing is just doing screenshots, but then I get all this other stuff in it and it's harder to go back and edit with them next time. Yeah. So is there a way to save what they annotate without, I know on the whiteboard you can save the whiteboard, but yeah. then I can't put something up in front of the whiteboard like to make the whiteboard transparent almost. I want the whiteboard to be like a transparency sheet. <laughs> right, I get it. And, and that's, that's doable in like WebEx and some of the other platforms. Oh. Uh, you actually upload a PDF, they annotate it, and you can save it. Um, that's where those are better than, um, than Zoom. I think you came up with a brilliant solution with the screenshot on, a, on the iPad. Uh, Dan, do you have any ideas? I, I don't think... You, other than I was going to say you could do it in the whiteboard, but that's not helpful for what you're talking about. Um, I think that's why I wanted to find out how many people were at different age groups. Uh, if you're in preschool, doing preschool, kindergarten, even first grade, then you, you need to rely on parental assistance yes. in a lot of this stuff. <laughs> so the, the parents, if, the, if, if you know that the parents are there, you can say, hey, uh, can you help them switch screens? Um, the other challenge is that like Chromebooks, a lot of schools issue Chromebooks. And Chromebooks have limited um, functionality. Uh, they, they, there's some certain functions that Chromebooks can't do. So I'll, I'll, I'll use a, an illustration that will hopefully inspire your creativity. If uh, you ever hear of um, um, the Colm concert by, I'm blanking on the guy's name now. Uh, hold on a second. Alexa, who did the Colm con concert? Concert, not Beach Boys, stop. <laughs> Alexa, stop. Oh, wait. You were telling me about this the other day. Yeah, and I can't believe I'm forgetting. I listen to him all the time. Um, Köln, Germany, concert, jazz. No, she's not even on. I actually do an, ac an activity with, I, I ask participants to uh, try and get Alexa to say a certain word. So, and it works pretty fun. Um, the, dang it. Well, Jazz musician traveling around Europe, and he uh, came. Up, he was supposed to play a concert in Köln, Germany, and uh, the piano was the wrong piano, out of out of tune, key stuck, and the um, producer of the concert said, "Could you please play?" So he said, "We're going to record this. We're going to show what a disaster it's going to be." But he'd been doing uh, improv jazz piano for a long time, and this piano forced him. The limitations of the piano forced him into a new state of mind. And so what was produced by the Cold Concert was the best-selling improv jazz album uh, in the 70s all the way up through current day. Um, so the idea of when you find yourself limited by Chromebook or limited by the fact that you can't do anything other than a screenshot, look at those limitations as um, prompts for creativity. And it may not be the right way, but if it works, it is the right way. It's what I call MacGyver thinking. And I used to do a whole workshop on MacGyver thinking. The idea is you start with the outcome and it may not be the most elegant way to get there, but if it gets you there, great. Then figure out the right way uh, and, and ask people how you do it. Because you may have discovered a way to do it that's more elegant than anywhere, anywhere else, even more elegant than, than Zoom. So that's my encouragement there. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it also goes to John's point from earlier that the Zoom whiteboard and, and Zoom annotation, like not the best version of those particular tools. It's great when you can keep people in Zoom, <clears throat> but if you, I mean, if you go to a Jamboard and have them collaborate there, you can, it all gets saved automatically. So I gotta, I gotta take off in just a minute here, but I got a, a one last question I think is really good. How do you typically manage breakout rooms in ensuring they have full directions on what they need to do uh, provide links and sort of facilitate to each room? Uh, yes. I think the, the, the most useful tool that I've used is putting in a, I create a breakout room Google Doc, one for each breakout room. 
And then I share that link and that's the guide. It's a discussion guide. And then if it's a little bit more in-depth process that we need to do, that's when I will have trained facilitators that I'll send out to each of those rooms. So, and with that, I've got a meeting in two minutes. Reach out to me, book a time online through my email. I would love to find out how I can help. Had somebody asked if they could do this for their cohort. If you wanna do this for your school, I'd be happy to set up uh, the same sort of orientation for your school and your teachers. Um, in the next month, I'm thinking, man, if I can support educators any way I can, I wanna give them hope and confidence. So thank you very much. And let me know how I can help you. Thank you, Dan, uh, for coming alongside me today. My pleasure, John, nice work.